is going to wind up as a white man against a colored man, and thank God we still have the majority. We will not be coerced into hiring any colored person, regardless of his qualifications, as a matter of duress or as a matter of expedience. Yeah. It's just that when somebody says <laughs> he wants 25 percent in by, say, the 15th or 17th of September, you can't push people. We I think there's nothing wrong with a school that's 100% Negro. When the Negro can prove to the white man that he can live like the white man, then we will accept them. And the only thing that scares me is the neighborhood all getting bad. And if we ever wanted to sell, naturally your house depreciation is the color get in. If they move in, the next step we have to accept is in our marriage. We can be sociable with them in work. We can get along with them and joke with them. Sure. But when we leave our job and close the door and we're on our way home, we want them to go in their direction and we can go in our. American is confronted with Negro Americans demanding freedom now. As you will see, he's confronted in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Falcroft near Philadelphia, and in the New York suburb of Malvern. And the white man is confronted here in New York City's borough of Queens. 
This is the construction site of a huge $96 million apartment complex and a continuing demonstration against alleged discrimination by construction unions. The unions deny discrimination. The Negroes say of 2,000 workers on the project, only 150 are Negro. Must go! Must go! Jim Crow! Must go! Jim Crow! Must go! Jim Crow! Must go! We all have the same thing here. And the main issue here, of course, is a uh, uh, continuing struggle against, uh, against construction unions, you know? Truthfully, they, uh, they want more freedom, I guess, you know, and uh, more advantages, stuff like that. But they shouldn't show it in this way, I don't think. It makes them look stupid. It's just a waste of time, I think. Of course, instead of people uh, thinking they're equal or people starting to like them, I think more people uh, hate them. So think it's, uh, they're acting like animals. Oh, hey, oh, what do you know? Jim Crow must go. Oh, ho, oh, oh, what do you know? Jim Crow must go. Oh, hey, oh, what do you know? Jim Crow must go. Oh, ho, oh, oh, what do you know? It's, uh, I, I'm just wondering whether it's a case of wearing out your welcome. We, we gonna, we, we'll be out here until the snow falls. We, we, we're going to stay here until uh, something gives. Something has to give somewhere. I only got a few more years to live, and I want everybody else to live, live, live. Go up in the mountains and hibernate. <laughs> Would you mind one way or the other? Not a way. Neither way? Neither way. Okay, what? What do you think about the demonstration, guys? I think they're nuts. Actually, they want to become president. Every one of them. And they don't want to work their way up. They want to start at the top. A lot of them. Uh, it took years for us to get the conditions we have today. And then we'll have somebody to come over and say, just push you on the side. He says, well, and, uh, we want to take your place. You just get the hell out. Everybody has a right to work. Because I'm looking to get out of the trade myself, you know. Not that glamorous a business. And it's a lot of hard work and uh, it's not so easy. But they, they got a right to live. I, they can come on in. If they come in the, the way we all came in, through the apprentice training program, then I believe it's, uh, like it's all right. Do you think this uh, kind of demonstration is effective? No. I think the leaders are taking advantage of it. Where are you from? Louisiana. What do you think about it? That's enough said, isn't it? Is it? No, from Louisiana. You don't care to comment anymore. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. We become cars here from North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and and uh, just stand here while they come through. You you have out of state workers in this place where a Negro can't get a job. What the woman can do here? The woman can do here how weak? The woman can do how weak? I'll tell you one thing, uh, as far as the picketing is concerned, they seem to be able to, they are getting a few a little results. They say we've been holding them down a long time, but she was, I never even thought about it. You know, like, uh, who had time to worry about them? I struggle myself. You know, it's been tough for outside too, but uh, it's hard work, it's not so easy. I don't think the average guy is... Uh, Feels that you know he wants to hold them down or anything like I'm local 28 chief metal worker. I don't think fellas in my union are prejudiced. I think anybody uh, really is prejudiced. You think the demonstrations are a good way for them to get well, into the, the union? Well, it's the only way we pick it too. I mean, we pick it when we want something, so it's only fair that they should pick it. Of course, lying in front of a truck. Uh, well, I think they did that back in the uh, 30s, so I really can't say too much about it. You know, we had our trouble too in Flint, Michigan. But, uh, you know, everybody gets hot on the call. If I come to you and say, I want you a job, you're going to get a little annoyed too. In other words. But uh, they just want a percentage. They, they want to work like anybody else.
I hold nothing against them. I feel most of the fellas feel the same way. We're a different stock today. We're not from the old school way. You know, uh, hooray for me and the heck with you. We're more or less, come on, give everybody an equal chance. You know, I feel that way. My wife feels that way. I'm raising my kid that way. Well, I got to go home. We shall not be moved. 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 train from Manhattan to Malvern, Long Island, a typical commuter train town. Eleven thousand prosperous suburbanites live here, including a fast-growing number of Negroes. Until recently, None of Malvern's whites would have thought a controversy involving race was possible in their town. And then a new term, de facto segregation, took on real meaning in Malvern. I think that uh, the Negroes in the North have been more often wrong than right. And I think the Negroes in the South have rarely been wrong. Al Hirschman is a retired Malvern businessman. A controversial order came down from the state school commissioner and Hirschman spearheaded a movement to fight it, in the courts and with pressure. The order, a plan must be adopted to end racial imbalance in the town's three elementary schools. One school is 80% Negro, the remaining two 80% white. Most of Malvern's Negroes live in a pleasant section called Lakeview. There are no Negroes living in the Malvern or the Lindbrook parts of the school district. When you, by choice, live in a community which is largely Negro or largely white, when you, by your own choice, do that, even though the choice is dictated with pressures such as difficulty in moving into another community, still it's by choice, there's no harm done. We're now going to go to Lakeview. And all the children in the district come to the um, junior and senior highs, yes, is that right? all of them, yeah. And in Lakeview, the uh, population is primarily Negro, is that correct? No, 50% Negro. But the population of the school, the Lakeview school, the school is 80% Negro. It, it, it will be this year. Then almost all of these newer homes were taken up by uh, Negro residents. Some of them have Cadillacs in front of them middle class and incidentally it's mostly these newer residents and the well-to-do people in them who are causing uh, the difficulties here they came here to reform the place the facts do remain that Negroes children do not perform as well in schools as white children now you can ascribe whatever reasons you want they're arguable but the statement I just made is not arguable because it's a matter of fact the strengths of the Negro race do not lie in the field of academic achievement as a group. Again, making this generalization which doesn't apply to individuals. And uh, where then is its strength? In the fields of emotion, in arts, in, uh, in uh, music, and things of that kind. If you lose the suit, if you lose the court case, what will happen? then I think Malvern School District 12 will become a totally Negro community. Why? Because I think the whites will get out and the Negroes will come in. If the, the, the conduct of the Negroes in the so of, of the North foreshadows what the Negroes of the South will want after they get an even break, then I say it's too bad for the country.
Hirschman is called the father of the Taxpayers and Parents Association, TAP, called TAP. TAP obtained a court order stopping the state commissioner's plan from going into effect, and a group went to Albany to picket the commissioner's house. We all went up to Albany. We picketed at Albany. And I want to say one very interesting fact came out of this trip. Since that time, we found that there are a lot of housewives in this community who would rather picket than do housework. <laughs> and we've had a real problem keeping them home in the homes. This group proposed the TAP Freedom Plan, which would allow any parent, Negro or white, to send his child to either of Malvern's three grammar schools. Each and every individual should have the right to decide for themselves which of the three elementary schools they feel is the most desirable for their children to attend. And they, and only they, should be able to make this decision. The only thing I'm saying is, I'm more interested in seeing what is to be offered as a solution to the problem. I do mind the traveling. What did you have against the traveling? The traveling, I don't drive. I have three little children. No matter which the way the decision goes, it is still going to leave the same problem. The decision is not going to be acceptable I to feel. one or another faction. Just a minute, yes, let me finish. Sure. Some people who are in favor of the Princeton plan have made it known that it's two, uh, that uh, it would be three quarters of a mile away, but that isn't so because we've clocked it directly from our door to the school, and it's a mile and three quarters. Under the Princeton plan, all Malvern children of a particular age group, both Negro and white, would be assigned to one school. One school building would be reserved for first, second, and third graders only. Its sponsors say the Princeton plan would prevent any one school from being more than 50% Negro. But they would actually have to go double the distance to that school if the Princeton plan went through. They said your, particular, your children in particular would have to... Uh, yes, my fourth grader would have to go, because they, they would have fourth and fifth grade in, in there. And, and every, every three years, uh, kindergarten, first, second, and third would be in this school. Fourth and fifth would be in this school. Sixth, would, sixth, seventh, and eighth would be in this school, and high school was here. So they would have to go to four different schools in, yeah. in, uh, in that time, and you know, during their uh, school career. Is and I have? think that that's too many times to change. Yeah. But uh, the thought that uh, they would have to go so far away just to balance the races, and I don't think that's good for them. That's another reason I don't like the Princeton plan. If this plan were put into, the put into effect for the reasons that they want to put it into effect, this would definitely take away everybody's rights in this one small area as far as education goes. And then the next step is going to be uh, telling people where they can live, housing, so on and so forth. It's got to come to that because if the state education department is going to try to control racial balance in the schools by destroying the neighborhood schools, and if people all move out of a neighborhood and let's say it becomes an all-white neighborhood and Rockwell Center becomes an all-Negro neighborhood, what are they going to do then? Merge school districts? And then the next step, when the people move again, if people move again and change where they uh, change the neighborhoods again, and then the next step is going to be to tell you, well, you can't move anymore. You have to stay there or you'll upset the racial balance. The real problem is the, the hysteria on the part of parents, you know, who I think, one, are really disappointed because the kids, they'd like them to be nearby, but, and two, I think because there are a lot of uh, feelings that go below the surface that maybe a lot of people aren't willing to recognize in themselves. Rabbi Samuel Cheel thinks something should be done to balance the races in Malvern schools. It's possible uh, to get both sides together. We're currently working on this. Now, you see, it seems to me that in the North, nobody's against uh, integration. Everybody's for integration. But uh, not now, not here. Maybe, you know, in next town, next century, but not here. And so... It seems to me that this is really a part of a strategy. The strategy is that you just can't say we're segregationists because only Governor Wallace can say that, you know. But uh, this can't be said in the North. Everybody's for integration. And, and I, I don't really think that they're bigots, but I think we ha all have a lot of problems and prejudice that uh, we're not willing to face. One can attempt to defer the solution 
to this problem by simply saying uh, it's a housing situation, it's a sociological problem, it's not a school problem. That's not facing the issue. In Malvern, it happens to be focusing on the schools. This is the place to, to start working on it. It's got to be broken somewhere. You just can't choose the place that you're going to start solving this problem. The Jefferson Bank, St. Louis, Missouri. Executive Vice President Joe McConnell is confronted. On the afternoon of August the 28th, 1963, which was the deadline set by the Corps organization uh, for our hiring four Negroes, two of the uh, representatives of Corps called at our bank and asked what we had intended to do. And I told them at that time that our position was clearly stated that we would continue to follow a policy of non-discrimination in hiring of any our, of, a, of all of our employees on a qualification basis if a need existed. And uh, they said, then you're not going to hire four people by today. And uh, we definitely said we would not do that. They said, well, then, uh, then, if we would call off this demonstration, would you, on a preferential basis, hire four Negroes within the next six months. And I explained then that that is exactly what they were preaching against. That would be discrimination against the white employee. And we would certainly not agree to that. The Congress of Racial Equality says the bank's practice contradicts its policy. Corps says it's been seven years since Jefferson Bank hired a Negro and points out there are 80 white and two Negro employees. Into the bank, or onto the bank property. They picketed for an hour and then they blocked our doors and then they entered our bank singing, chanting, clapping and uh, obstructing our business. We were absolutely unable to do any business at the time. In spite of our statements to them that we would continue a non-discriminatory hiring policy, One of our most trusted employees, uh, colored boy who's been with us, I think, uh, close on to 15 years. Started as a paper boy on the corner of Jefferson and Franklin Avenue. We put him to work as a porter, then as a bank messenger, and finally, uh, five or six years ago, as a statement teller, and then as a teller. Dave? Dave, I want you to meet uh, Mr. Page. Hello, how are you? I've uh, been telling Mr. Page that you've been with us for, what, 15 years or 13 years? 13. 13, 13 years. years. Have they been pleasant years, Dave? Very pleasant. Well, that's what I was uh, telling Mr. Page, and uh, I was also telling him uh, how you felt about the demonstrations here at the bank. Yes, sir. How do you feel? Well, I think they made a stupid move. I think they were wrong in the way they came in. You don't demand anything. You should ask people and negotiate with them. That's the way I feel about it. And I think if they had came in and in the right manner and to due process, they would be given every consideration. But they didn't come that way. They came in with demands. That's right. And they came in and told us how many we had to hire by a given date, that's right. and that's what we presented. That's right. Regardless of what our needs were, regardless of what their qualifications were. I just to tell you, Mr. Page, I just love to have more people like you in this bank. And maybe uh, as a result of the publicity, uh, given this thing, we'll be able to accomplish that someday. Well, I hope so, Mr. McCown. Well, I hope so, too, Dave. Thank, Thank you. you. Glad to mention that. Not quite, sir. Yeah, we'd just love to have more people of his integrity uh, employed by our bank. We don't think of him as a colored man. We think of him as one of our people. And all of the people in the bank feel the same way. And that's why we've been so desirous of having him. Uh, qualified Negroes apply here. We know that they uh, have ability if they have had the proper training. Uh, we, we know that they're entitled to equal opportunity. We don't think they're entitled to preferential treatment. And uh, certainly we're not, uh, that would be discriminatory in itself to give preferential treatment to any group as distinguished from another group. Our position is clear. We intend to follow it. Uh, we don't think we're the first bank picked out, but we think we're the first bank in St. Louis uh, who stood up 
for the rights granted all of us, whether we're bankers or garage men, to run our own businesses on a basis of opportunity, qualification, and need. That is our position. And we will continue to follow that position, regardless of threats and intimidation and coercion and everything else that's been applied. Negro jazz trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie staged a one-man sit-in at this barber shop in Chicago's Loop. He sat for six hours without service, got his hair cut the next day after a man from the Human Relations Commission called on the owner. What about the problem of uh, Negroes who come into your barber shop and want their hair cut or to any barber shop? What's the main problem with that, Mr. Brown? Well, that's, that's the problem that uh, a lot of us don't know how to cut their hair. It's, uh, it's very hard because uh, we're not used to cutting that type of hair. As I was saying, when I went to a barber college, we used to have about uh, 17, 18 barbers there, and they had three color barbers. Mm -hmm. And every time a color man come in, why they would give it to them. So therefore, we had no opportunity to cut those people's hair. So their hair is strictly all by clipper, and I can't use clippers. What happened when uh, Gillespie came in here? Well, uh, I, I didn't know how to cut his hair. He had, he had taken an awful chance of getting the hair cut off of me. But not only that, but if a color man comes in to get a haircut by us, it hurts all these color barbershops. They got, they got a lot of good barbershops in the city of Chicago. I mean, real good. Better, better class than, than mine. Was Gillespie the first colored man who had yes. ever come in? Did you know who he was? No, I, did, I didn't. What do you think of... Uh, a public accommodation bill, a, a law that would would insist that you had to do this, that you had to cut anybody's hair regardless of their age. Well, I said I would get uh, because the uh, the uh, situation. I wouldn't know how to cut it. I think I would quit the bar business. I'm concerned. You mean you'd get out of business? That's right. thousand whites march on Chicago City Hall, opposing an open occupancy bill under consideration by the City Council. The marchers want a statewide referendum on the question, but the bill passes anyway and makes it illegal for real estate brokers to discriminate in the sale or rental of housing. The march was organized by Howard Skamen the 31-year-old chairman of the Property Owners Coordinating Committee. The committee is made up of representatives from neighborhood organizations throughout Chicago. I can't see how they can uh, pass something like this when the state uh, voted against it. Well, they, they won't be able to after we get through with them. Well, see, that's, that's a relief. Okay, but sir. It's good to know that somebody's still fighting for the white people. Oh. You see, they're stepping all over us. I have to work with them downtown and brother. Skamen is becoming a familiar public figure in Chicago. There's even talk of running him for Congress. I'll go to anyone within a week. Sir. Within a week, yes, sir. All right, I'll get a few circulating. I'll get them signed by plenty of guys. Because I, all the employees that I talk with, white ones, I mean, they're against it. But they say... What they say to me is, what can we do about it? Nobody's doing anything about it. We're getting something done now. <laughs> that's, that's what I like to hear. Okay, okay sir. Thank you for calling. Good morning. Parking lot up for the apartment buildings that he owns on either side here. Skamen says he's against open occupancy laws on constitutional grounds. But he frankly admits no Negroes are wanted in South Lawndale. Well, why basically, though? Do these people not want the Negroes to come in? Well, it's not uh, not a fear of Negroes per se. It's a uh, definite fear of anyone who would run down their neighborhood. Home is probably the most important thing to uh, people of this basic ethnic background. These are primarily Bohemian, Polish people. 
People have a great deal of pride in their homes. All you have to do is look at uh, what we're coming up to here ahead of us is, while it's not typical of the community, it's certainly uh, not the exception to the rule. Here's a man who has a parking lot. Uh, check that over there. <laughs> There's a group of the, uh, the boys who are off work this afternoon. We have, uh, these gentlemen are out from Boston, yeah. and they're here filming a, uh, a report in Chicago. And basically, they're trying to understand why we don't want colored people to move into this neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about it? Not sure. <laughs> I don't want to be here either. They, I'm clean, and uh, you know what they do all, all the time. And we don't want to. As long as we can hold it, so we hold it without them. They passed that law that you have to do the colored people, huh? It's not passed yet. But uh, <laughs> we're still fighting them. <laughs> that, would, uh, that wouldn't do them any, uh, any good anyway. Because uh, if colored people come, then I can say $150 for the threat. Then he wouldn't take it. See, so. so the law doesn't so mean So the law don't, the law don't, 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 don't stop us. That's why people don't, don't put no more threats, threats for them. They could have put it there. If, if current people come, to, they can say, they can say it, it's gone because he got a ticket in the window, but, but he gets $150. What are they going to do? They can kind of walk away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. They go to restaurants out here, nobody bothers them. They, yeah. As far as that. But I don't believe that they should really... Uh, you have the right to... No, sure. The as long as we can keep it, so we keep it. Sell it or rent it to who you please, and not to what to tell you to rent it. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen. Appreciate it a lot. You're welcome. It's all right. It's all right. I'll be back with the uh, Daily News to okay, take pictures right. in a few thanks, weeks. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Well, let's go and take a look at the uh, the adjacent neighborhood. All right. Thank you. What are you taking them in for? What are you doing? This is what our community doesn't want to happen. Well, you can go almost anywhere and find run-down neighborhoods uh, like this one. But why would it be necessarily true that uh, a neighborhood would be run down just because Negroes moved in? Uh, this isn't true at all. Uh, <coughs> you take our Chatham section here, which is one of the very finest residential uh, areas in the city, almost exclusively Negro. The property is extremely well maintained, uh, beautifully kept up. Uh, it's a very, very desirable community to live in. My point is, these are our immediate neighbors here. Uh, and this is why you find so much resistance, uh, not only in our community, but in all the immediate marginal areas to this community and others such as Woodland. In other words, your people feel that this is what would happen to their neighborhood. This is what would happen to their neighborhood. You feel that way too? I know it would. If you think on the northwest side of the city of Chicago that you are going to be living in an all-white community indefinitely, you're mistaken. You are eventually going to live in an either integrated or inundated community. Now, I really envy you out here in the northwest side of the city of Chicago because you are very, very far removed from the real problems that exist. You don't have slums within a block or two of you. But if open occupancy bills are passed in the city of Chicago, it will directly affect you. We feel that if this bill is permitted to be enforced, it will cause a mass exodus of the people who can afford to move
from Chicago into the suburbs where they think they're protected. We feel that Chicago will become a mecca for all, let's face it, Negro immigrants from all over the entire country. It's very easy to get on the relief rolls here. Now, there are reasons for opposing open occupancy legislation on constitutional grounds. There is no one or no legislative body or no government which has the right to tell you who you should sell or rent your property to. Well, the Supreme Court has not ruled on it, and they refuse to do so. Might be nice if we had a Supreme Court of our own for a change. How do you feel about the clergy of Chicago? Uh, Ooh. And, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, telling us that uh, it's more or less our moral obligation to accept integration and stuff, I mean... They all take the same moral position, that social justice and equality for all people is the right thing to do. I believe in this. I support it, and I'm sure you do. Uh, but any time the Catholic Church or whatever faith they belong to tells me I'm supposed to vote for bill number so-and-so, I'm going to tell them just where to go. Why do they want to go into a white neighborhood? They don't. I mean, the city of Chicago builds them beautiful housing. Have you ever been in it? Yeah. No, I haven't been, but before they occupy it, they are beautiful. It's going to come eventually. I'd say in 200 years, we're all going to be of one race. One race. And after all, the white people are a majority, not a minority. This we know. I'm, I mean, I wouldn't say whether I was or I, I am or against or for something of this sort. I'm not, like you say, I'm not against any uh, color that's... Uh, they have a right to education, but as far as uh, our rights, we should have a right to sell the girl we want. Would you want to live next door to a Negro? No. The Chicago Real Estate Board is fully backing Skamen's fight and published a leaflet called Forced Housing. The board's president is Percy E. Wegner. Well, in general, <clears throat> how do you feel about any legislation aimed at the broker that has the objective of uh, open occupancy. We think that it is illegal, that you have no, no right to enact a law which has to do with the human rights and the property rights of individuals, and that it's a violation of both the 13th and the 14th Amendment, the Constitution and the Illinois Constitution. You purchase a, a property because you desire to live in a certain place. And you have, therefore, also the right to sell and to rent. That's a fundamental human right as well as a property right. And you take that away from a person, you are taking away from him his constitutional rights. I don't, I don't ask people to my house my home, on my property, that are not acceptable to me. Neither does anyone else. Many white men, I wouldn't have step across my threshold. Right? Would you? Do you allow everybody to come in your house? That's all there's to it. Do Negroes come into my house? Do, a, do, a, do a Chinese come into my house? Do I entertain them in my house? Yes. At my choosing, see, the same as they accept me in their home. Don't forget that in Chicago, the International Real Estate Federation had a convention here in June in which we had 348 members of the Real Estate Federation of all races, all creeds, who joined together in a convention. And next year, we're going to Israel, see. The solution to a problem of this type lies in education. Education uh, in both races, both in the white race and the Negro race. Whether over the course of time there will be integration to the point of acceptance of all peoples by each other is something that I don't believe any man could, could foretell. 
uh, people don't accept each other up, uh, up per se. You have your own friends. You have your own people that, that you choose to live with. We might even say that amongst our relatives we don't get along well together. So to expect that, 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 that by law you can make why a social change of this type is pretty far, far seen and far reaching. There are 1,500 row houses in Del Mar Village, a seven-year-old housing development in Fallcroft, Pennsylvania. Homes in this Philadelphia suburb sell for 10 to $11,000, and the people of Fallcroft call them their dream houses. Most of Fallcroft's residents work in the technical labor field. They make between $45 and $8,500 a year. They are proud of their community. Until recently, it was all white. Then, Horace Baker, his wife and little girl moved in. trying to move into a home in which you'd purchased and that you weren't trying in any way to interfere with anyone else's life or their uh, their property but yet you were and in the morning. They just got in there without anybody seeing them, but they waited till 5 o'clock at night. Early in the morning, they could have just snuck in there. Why didn't they do that? The newspapers, the TV, the radio, they gave a false conception of what happened in Delmar Village. Tonight, at 7.05, on WIBG, they had a program called World in Perspective, which was called Disgrace of Delmar Village. Now the people in this village and the people of Fallcroft do not feel that this is right. The newspapers, the television and the radio have not seen our side of it. I think they're getting paid to move in. Hmm? I think they're getting paid to move in. Any color that moves into this area, I'm sure, is only coming in here for one reason. That's to bust the neighborhood down, discourage the white person, stop the whites from moving into the area, and hope that it'll, it'll be converted to a, a Negro uh, integrated development. Aside from being forced integration, it's forced legislation. Well, what, what I can't understand is that this is supposed to be a free country, and great nation and whatnot, and yet you hear them say, oh, I'm afraid I won't say anything, I'll lose my job. That's right. 
Hey, look, hey, I work, I work, with, I work with 400 color people. And out of them 400 people, I mean, a lot of them have felt the same way I did. They, but they had a lot of guts moving out here. Sure, I've heard lots of different uh, color people themselves say the same thing. That it wasn't right. They, uh, now what, something's wrong somewhere. Free country, and they're afraid, everybody's afraid to open their mouths, afraid they'll lose their job. Well, they're afraid of the pressure of the, of the NAACP because they exert the pressure on the employer, but the, uh, the employer is afraid to buck them and say, well, I'll keep the man on. And he takes the easy way out, the same as the big food stores, the government, and everybody else. They don't want to buck the tide, they say to speak. But the only thing that really scares me is if the car did move in next door. My little girl grew up with the little boy next door, and he, she liked him. I mean, like, yeah, I don't understand the intermarriage. That's one thing that I don't like at all, and that's what I would be afraid of, because she grew up next door to him, and she liked him, and I know it, the uh, majority, like, uh, usually don't marry the boy next door. That doesn't usually happen, but if they grew up together and went to school together, and I think if they were mixed, I think that that would be the next thing, that there would be a lot of that in a marriage. I don't, I don't, that I don't see, uh -uh. that's the only thing that, but as far as them as people, and uh, they're the same as me, I don't lower them in any way. There probably are a lot more of them that are better than me, but that's, that's the thing that bothers me on intermarriage, I don't like that. Well, I can't see why that this color family, Negro family, moved down to Delmar Village, where Within four blocks away, they built a new house development, and they're still building it, but they couldn't move down there. And I can't see them moving down Delmar Village, where houses are anywhere between five and ten years old, and trying to move in something old, and yet they can move in a new house. What are they trying to prove? A lot of people in this world think that the Negro I say Negro, has a place in this world. He does have a place in this world. The Negro wants, does not want equality. He wants preference. Who was it President Kennedy says in his inauguration well, address, Jeopardy, ask not what... <laughs> what? your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. What has the Negro race done for their country since 1960? I don't know, but we've done a lot. We have done an awful lot. <laughs> They're pushing too hard. They're pushing the white people too hard. And something's got to be done. I don't know what, but we're going to maybe have to start right here in Falkville. The newly appointed block captains of Del Mar Village meet. Their purpose? to keep the people of the village informed and freeze out the bakers. No white in Falcroft has spoken out in defense of the bakers. The block captains say they speak for all of Falcroft's white residents. Anything that's done here violently in Falcroft is against the federal government. That's why our mayor had to go with the federal government. And I, I think everybody in this town understands that, that these people had the right to come into Falkroft and live like first-class citizens. But to me, and I think to 90% of the white people, they haven't proved themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, the Italian people, when they came to this country, I understand, they had Little Italy. Uh, the Germans, they had their towns. And they proved one thing to each other, that they could live with each other. Unfortunately, these people came out here and gave everybody the impression that they were being pushed in by an outside organization, although it's been denied. I believe they can deny anything. I believe we brought up a point, though. When you purchased your house, how many times did you look at it? I cut oh, 10 or 12 times, right. more than uh, that. Now, Every week I believe we the there. bakers, uh, I say the bakers, looked at their house only once. I found out and they visited their home once. Mm -hmm. If it was such a dream house, I'm sure, before the uh, settlement time came around, they would have been inspecting the house more than... Uh, well, I'd have slept in that house. five or six times. At least me, I bought the house before it was even built. Well, I'd have and slept in that house, Tom. Right. It was such a dream house before they put the roof on. 
That's right. Well, Jack, is another point that I'd like to bring up. Uh, for instance, when these television men, white television men, interview these colored people, I would just like once, just once, for this colored man to ask this man where he lives. Where do you live? Do you live with colored people? Or do you have a nice home, uh, three acres of ground with a house right in the middle, and you're one of these saying, integrate? That's quite well, right. And that's, what, that's what's burning everybody up. I mean, with these row homes, you're living next door to each other. And... I mean, contact every day. You share a common, a common walk, common, common walk. steps. You have nothing but perhaps six inches of masonry between you and your neighbors. If they get a little loud, you're aware of it. There's no doubt about this. Everybody has to be more concerned with their neighbors than, uh, than we would otherwise. The whole truth in a nutshell, the 90% of the whites that, uh, that live in Falkroft have ran away from the color people. They have, I ran away from the color people. I will not deny this. My wife, when I lived in Philadelphia, I had uh, <clears throat> my family would try to go to the store. My wife, for instance, would try to go to the store, 8 o'clock at night. She couldn't make it. It was because the 80% of the colored people had moved into West Philadelphia. And I had to run. I have to protect my family. I can't, I, it's no sense. I, I tried. I had a colored fella living next door to me. An ace. This man was better than any white man that I know. He was an ace. And he told me, I hate to use this word nigger, but he told me that nigger riffraff is moving in, Eric, and I'm going to move out. I have to move out of this town myself. And for instance, right down here, we have uh, a beautiful colored settlement. Beautiful. These people have come to our stores. We, I work with colored people. They're wonderful. I think they're, I think they're great. I mean, the people working for me. But I can't see them living on my doorstep because they have proved nothing to me. Let's take the Baker family, for example. He moved into our area on the 29th day of August. This man, it was advertised on WIP in Philadelphia. This man went to Florida. His wife returned to work. This is the same damn kind of responsibility, irresponsibility, that we're talking about. His wife was working. He was in Florida. Where was the daughter? The daughter has been in Sellersville, Pennsylvania, with the mother-in-law. Now, this is the same kind of thing that we're talking about. Irresponsibility. My children are home. My children haven't been farmed out since I've been married. Have yours? This is a normal deal. A girl integrated a university. What'd she do? She married a white fella from Boston, or from Massachusetts. Her father thought it was a disgrace. Why did he think it was a disgrace? This man possibly could have been paying lip service to integration. Now, it, it, it's just this simple. Now, we've had do-good ministers that have donated money to these people. Who else has donated money? Every taxpayer in the United States of America has donated money to these people. For what? Why does the American person try to buy his conscience with a dollar? They just don't want to face it, Joe. The white people just don't want to face, face this thing. And they're just backing down on every, uh, on everything that uh, the NAACP... Well, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think they don't want to face it. I think uh, hey, what every I white think? man would like to do his share, or, but they're afraid. Now, this NAACP is, an, is a national movement. Not, not that. It's a powerful organization. It's a communistic we've, we've organization. Had, we've had men from this village fired from their jobs because their pictures were in the paper. This is true. Now, what, what, uh, what uh, kind of rights does the, 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 the white man have when this has to happen? They're all afraid to move. It's, it gets back to what I said again. This is an organized minority group that's taken charge of an unorganized majority group. They vote in a block, which is what we have to do. We have to vote in a block. We always fight when our backs are against the wall. This is, this is the same with, uh, with a lot of animals, which we're all animals. They're jokes. But some of us are cannibals. But we got not sell this short. But uh, we can't fight, Joe, because... Uh, this is one country. I mean, uh, this is uh, what the uh, Communist Party wants. 
They're going to destroy us within. And I tell you, Joe, we, we can't say fight. I mean, we've got to iron well, this thing I'm out without fighting. fighting. I'm, I'm talking you about mean fighting winning our politicians. legislation. Yeah, fighting our legislation because uh, this is one country, Joe. I agree. And we've got to get this thing ironed out amongst ourselves. We need no other country to iron this thing out. This, has got, this has got to be ironed out by our politicians and straight through. I mean, level. No, no backbiting and level this thing out to the people. Tell this NAACP what's going to happen. Come out truthfully and tell what 90% of the white people want them to know, Joe, because we smile at a colored man at work. We smile, we laugh, but look what happened here in Falkroft. The other side of the face was turned. His, his face was slapped. It could have been the same man that you work with or I work with. It could have been true. I mean, we have to level this thing. And we don't want to live with him. That's all there is to it. Your Honor, did he say Hatton Avenue or Hatfield Avenue? The Pennsylvania State Police, still guarding the Baker's house on Heather Road. This is the type of a feeling that I felt that in the home that we would purchase in whatever neighborhood, we would uh, earn the neighborhood's respect. This is what I do. And this Sort of my philosophy in life is in earning people's respect and being just treated as an individual and not trying to be stereotyped with any type of a, a group or race or creed. And, well, let's say I feel as though as far as pigmentation, that's about the only difference that we majorly have. I don't feel as though, let's say, uh, with with the education that you, re that you receive, it, there shouldn't be any other differences, and every summer, let's say the Caucasians, they, they try to go and get themselves tanned and try to match you up with that. So, really, I don't feel as though there should be that many differences, or such a, a cruel type of a feeling. How do you think this is uh, going to affect your child? Uh, she wasn't here during uh, the, first, the first week that we were here, and let's say as far as uh, the type of a uh, feeling that's going on. I don't feel as a directly she would be aware. Of. Maybe in a, in a year or so she would. But right now I don't feel unless someone actually told her she she knows no prejudice at all. And she'll say hello to anyone. Has she said hello to any of the residents in Falkland? I'm sure she has. She went out outside. I guess it was the same day that she came here, and uh, the neighbors next door had put up uh, a wrought iron rail at the top, but they put it off just enough off uh, center that it meant sort of taboo that we weren't supposed to touch it. And so, of course, she not knowing that this, she went down and touched it, and some neighbor hollered, get that baby's hand off the rail. And so with that, I just told her not to touch it, but I'm sure she'll touch it again until we put up a railing beside it so that she doesn't come in contact with that one. But this is what I mean. Children actually don't know this type of a, of a thing. It has to be instilled upon them. Chicago, St. Louis, and in suburban Falkroft, Pennsylvania, we've seen how some white Americans in the North responded when confronted with Negro Americans demanding freedom now. We've seen white opposition increase as the Negro came closer and closer, until in Falkroft, Pennsylvania, the strongest fears, integrated housing and intermarriage, erupted into violence. When a lack of understanding and emotion take over, as they did in Falcroft, how are these real feelings to be dealt with? Perhaps the rioting on that Falcroft street could have been avoided if some organization, apart from the civil rights groups, had helped the people of Falcroft overcome their fears. The major civil rights groups have sought mainly to desegregate, to open doors to Negroes that once were open only to whites. As those doors began to open, the hope was that new contacts between Negroes and whites would mean improved white attitudes. 
And in many cases, new contacts have helped the white man look at the Negro man in a new and kinder light. There are places where real integration is proceeding peacefully. But as long as there are whites who respond with bitterness and even violence, the white man's emotions cannot be ignored. Following a summer of growing white resistance in the North, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has recognized this. Talking about the Northern white, he said recently, we can never have meaningful integration until these prejudices are recognized and discarded. Obviously, a major effort by both races is needed to see that these prejudices are recognized and discarded. The American Negro is now making an unprecedented effort to gain his freedom and the respect of whites. The American white is going to have to make an equal effort to prepare for the day when he is confronted. Most white Americans have not yet been confronted, confronted by the Negro who will not go away. The schools, churches, the government agencies, the communications media, all have a responsibility to help the white man accept his new relationship with his fellow Negro citizen. But ultimately, whether or not the white man receives the help he needs, it will be the truly personal decisions that count. And so every white American now needs to ask himself, what will my answer be when I am confronted? This is NET, National Educational Television.